Good morning, 704. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Well, it's been a wonderful morning so far. Ada, you've blessed me tremendously with that. And, right? And you know what was even the bigger blessing for me is to see how God is using you. You made a decision for Christ, you came forward, and you've allowed yourself to be open to what God's gonna do through you. And so you've been such a blessing to us. I really thank you for that. My name is Sharon Gill, and I'm on the teach team here at 704 Church. I'm also, um, I serve as a leadership strategist here for the leadership team at 704 Church. Uh, Pastor Thad asked me to introduce myself, reintroduce myself, so I brought some pictures if you guys have that. All right, so right there at the top is my love, Wayne Gale. Some of you guys know him. We, <laughs> we've been married for 35 years, and um, Wayne's preached here a few times, and I think he's preaching at some point next, next month. Uh, in the middle is my son, Gavin. Uh, when Wayne preached a few weeks ago, he mentioned that Gavin, who was two pounds, one ounce when he was born, Gavin was the reason that got me back into church to rededicate my life and got Wayne into church. So he's my firstborn right there. And of course, last but by no means least is my beautiful daughter, Brittany, who's here with me today, and my granddaughter, Aaliyah, who's vacationing in Florida. So that's my family, and honestly to God, they keep me grounded. I'm so grateful to them. So this week, we're going to continue in Colossians 3. Pastor Thad did the first half last week, and I'm going to be doing the second half. So we're going to pick up at 3, verses 12 to 17. But before I get started, I want to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Your presence is here, Lord, and we are just so grateful for what you're doing through our church and in us individually. Lord, your word is never void. So Father, we just ask now that we be decreased while you'll be increased in us and in this word, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so reading from Colossians 3, 12 to 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So whenever you see a therefore in scripture, we've, you know, we've been told that there's something that came before. So last week, Pastor Thad spoke on uh, if he, uh, Colossians 3, verses 1 to 11, and he spoke about some of the things we had to unclothe, right, but it put off. And I am going to be talking about some of the virtues that we have to put on this week. So an illustration came to me while I was preparing this message. So bear with me one second. I need to use your imagination. So I'm going to be putting on a couple of sticky notes. So I'm putting on wrath. Can you guys see that? All right. So I'm putting on anger. I'm putting on just lies. And I'm putting on one more malice. And when I ask my assistant, Wayne, to come here one second. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. And I'm going to put on a jacket right here. I'm going to put on my jacket. And I'm going to cover over these. So let me ask you a question. I have this jacket on, I'm putting on something fresh and new. But is the anger, wrath, lies, and malice still there? Yeah. It is, right? So this is where we want to start. Before we can truly appreciate what we're going to hear today, we have to go back to next week. And I'm not going to go back to next week. It's on YouTube. But we have to take off these things, the lies, the anger, the wrath, and the malice, and all the other things we were told to unclothe ourselves from last week. All right, so 
That's the word picture I want you to have in your mind as we go through what the Apostle Paul was saying to the church in Colossians. And we, is, imagine he's saying these things to us right now. So we're going to be putting on some virtues today. But I want to start, it says, the word chosen, or elect in some translation, it says, the word chosen means God chose us, right? And when we elect a leader, right? When we elect a leader, it could be a political leader, it could be a leader of the church, it could be a leader of your board. What we're essentially saying is that we're choosing you. We're choosing you. And so who better <laughs> to elect us than God himself? In Ephesians 1, verses 4, it says, God chose us to belong to Christ before the world was created. He chose us to be holy and without blame in his eyes. Now, sometimes the word chosen triggers a reaction, right? So if you're sitting here today and you're saved, and you're, you know, you're chosen, and you may, feel, you may feel positive about that. Now, on the other hand, if you're sitting here today and you're not saved or someone did, you know, is in your family is not saved, you may feel a sense of discomfort. You may even wonder, what is saved? I mean, and there's some folks watching online. And you'll have an opportunity at the end of service, right, when we do the uh, invitation, to actually speak with someone here about what is salvation, what is saved if you're not saved. But if you're saved, right, God chose you to be holy, which means set apart. And so because of that, he has some expectations of us, just like we have expectations of leaders. Now, I remember um, a, a, a relative of mine, she would say, look, I'm standing at this crossroads because God hasn't chosen me yet. And friends, I don't know how God chose his people. That's over my pay grade, right? I have no idea how he does that. But that's what the scripture says, and we have to believe it. Um, in John 15 and 16, it says, you have not chosen me. I have chosen you and appointed you so that you might go out, bear fruit. And as, as I'm thinking of Ada um, bearing some fruit already based on her decision, right? Bear fruit, fruit that will last so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. When we're chosen of God, it's a privilege, it's an honor, right? And God says that whatever we ask in his name, he'll give it to us. And so he's going to be asking some things of us in today's scripture, right, to put on some virtues. And we are empowered to do so. So what are his expectations of us, his chosen ones? Again, a reminder that when we elect leaders, right, we expect them to perform. And when they don't, we kick them out. Now, thank God he doesn't kick us out when we, <laughs> when we falter. Thank the Lord for his grace. However, he still has expectations of us. So one of my favorite words is the word intentional. As I mentioned, I'm a coach. So I'm always telling my clients, be intentional. I know some of my clients are actually watching today. Be intentional, be intent, right? Have intent. So the first thing that the scripture mentions here is to put on compassion. And the Greek uses the term <clears throat> bowels of compassion because the Greeks believe that the seat of emotion was in your intestinal area. And that's why we say we are sick to our stomach or we feel it in our gut. But and let me ask you, in a church of this size, do you think that we would have opportunities to use compassion? Yes. Right, because compassion means sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. Remember, in this context, Paul is speaking to the church. So I want you to imagine Pastor Thad speaking to our church, and he's saying, put on compassion. And I like to describe compassion as God's love in action. Um, several years ago, Wayne and I created a nonprofit, and it was called Oasis Compassion Agency. And the idea of that agency was to come alongside the church, the Church of God, church plural, and to illustrate you know, what it looked like to have their practical needs met. And we did this through food, clothing, biblical encouragement, etc. And it was a very successful mission because it was, for, for some people, it was their first encounter with God. 
It was their first encounter with God, and they could see God's love demonstrated through action. And that got a lot of people to join the traditional church, right? And when, when we have compassion, when we display compassion individually, my friends, we are going to be able to attract people to us and then have the opportunity to share Christ with them. So put on compassion. Uh, the next one was to kindness, to put on kindness. You know, we have been saved by the kindness of God who gave us his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. We live in a very unkind world, my friends. You know, we're affected by it in so many ways, right? We see social media, it has the power to do so much good. Right now we're streaming on social media. Power to do so much good. But what we often see is unkindness, even from the household of faith. And I remember years ago when <laughs> I didn't have a naturally generous nature, right? So I was kind to my family, I was kind to my friends, but you know, that was pretty much the limit. And I distinctly remember a cousin of mine who was unchurched, and unlike me, you know, was attending church every Sunday, she would give the shirt off her back to anyone. And I experienced such a conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I, I said, you know, the question that came to my mind was, why should an unchurched, non-Christian person be kinder than me, a churched Christian person? And I asked the Lord to replace the heart I have and give me a kinder heart. And the Lord did, and that's kind of how I ended up starting that charity. God did, and I am, you know, the things that the Lord is asking us to put on today, I don't want you to think of your husband or your wife or your kid or your boss or whoever. I want you to consider drawing a circle around yourself and, you know, see which of these are resonating with where you're at in your spiritual journey right now. Because we're not, none of us is perfect. I was challenged by every single virtue over the last few weeks as I'm preparing for this sermon. It, <laughs> I had to just keep going back to it. The next virtue is humility. And I like to look at the opposite of humility as prideful. One definition says, humility is a freedom from pride or arrogance. Have you ever met an arrogant person, anyone? Okay, they, they know everything, right? They're, they, you know, you can't tell them something they don't know. And I do believe that we're all, we all have a tendency to be arrogant in our areas of strength, right? Remember, all of these virtues is to make the church a better place, right? So these kinds of um, wrong attitudes will not foster that spirit of community. So this is for us. Paul wasn't speaking to the world. He wasn't speaking to our arrogant boss. He was speaking to us as arrogant Christians, of Christians who weren't humble. And so, you know, we are prone to a little arrogance. And I think humility is the only antidote of pride. Pride is a dangerous thing, and it always comes before a fall. Uh, the scripture says in 1 Peter 5, verses 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want God resisting me because I have way too much prayer requests for God. I need to be in his grace, right? So a humble person is teachable. A prideful person is less so. When I think of a prideful person, I think of Romans 3.23. It says... Through the grace giver given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. I use the term being self-aware, right? Be self-aware, but be sober-minded in your self-awareness, right? It, be sober-minded in your self-assessment self of yourself. Christ gave us the best example in Philippians 2, 6 to 8, one of my very favorite passage of scripture, Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. 
Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know, humility is asking you to step back a little bit from your rights, to step back a little bit, be more gracious, right? You don't have to always, we don't have to always be right, right? We don't have to always, you know, um, want to be uh, perceived as, okay, the greatest thing, right? Step back a little bit from your rights. I mean, if Christ could do it, certainly we could. And I would say the cousin of humility is meekness, which is the next virtue that we're asked to put on. And we oftentimes think of meekness as a mouse, meek as a mouse, something or someone scampering away. But the definition of meekness that I love is strength under control, right? Strength contained. And that takes something, that takes character. You know, Moses was, was called the meekest man on the face of the earth. But remember, Moses was the same guy who killed an Egyptian with his bare hands. Moses led two million people in the desert, or in the wilderness. Moses also struck that rock, right? So he's not a, he wasn't a timid, shy person. But here's what happened to Moses, right? Moses was that way, I think, mostly in his BG days, his BC days, his before God, his before Christ day. But I think when Moses had that encounter with God, that burning bush encounter, he became a changed man, right? God gave him a new nature. And I think that's what Christ is saying to us, right? Paul is saying to the Colossians church, hey, man, you've been, you've been clothed in Christ now, right? So your nature should change. Your nature should change, right? Our nature should change. We shouldn't be that BC person. If we're still that before Christ person, we have work to do. And that's why I'm saying today, as we, we hear these different virtues that we have to put on, the circle should be drawn around ourselves. It's not to the left or to the right. It's around what is God saying to me right now? Um, so, you know, Jesus, right? I, I like his example. He, he washed his disciples' feet. And I, he could have easily said, hey, guys, we've been together for three and a half years now. You've seen my miracles. I'm about to be crucified. Let me give you guys the honor of washing my feet. He, I mean, it would be justified. But instead, we know he didn't do that, right? We know that he wrapped a towel around his waist, got on his knees, and wash those disciples' dusty, sandaled feet. That's the picture of humility and meekness. Christ was Christ, God in flesh, yet he contained his strength, he controlled his strength, it was his strength contained. And that's what he's asking us to do. We don't have to always be in our strength, not for the body of Christ. See, we are one body, right? as Christ said. He said, you know, some of us are eyes, head, you know, fingers, toes, whatever. You know, that's the head, you know, you know, maybe a finger, etc. But if I, you know, if my toe should say to me, I didn't like the color of your nail polish, I need, I'm gonna go, and I'll be toeless, <laughs> right? And if my arm said, I don't like that leg, and now I'm, I have one arm, right? So that's the whole picture. We're a body, and so we have to work together. And what Paul is saying to the Colossians church is, in order for us to really have this wonderful unity, we have to put on these virtues. Uh, the next one is patience, or some translations say long-suffering. You know, my, my six-year-old granddaughter said to me recently, hey, Grandma, I learned a new word. I said, what's that word? She said, it's perseverance. I thought that was interesting. I said, what does it mean? She said, sticking to it. So long-suffering, like kindness, is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5.22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And this means that in every Spirit-filled believer, we have the capacity to be a long-sufferer, a patient person. And it is defined as having or showing patience despite troubles, especially troubles caused by other people. 
So it's to be long-tempered, patient. Again, this is not a show of weakness, but a show of inner strength, grace, and patience. You know, we are supposed to bear the fruits of the Spirit, right? It says, as Holy Spirit-filled believers, we're supposed to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But if it was so easy, right, if it just happened naturally because we were saved, then Paul wouldn't be imploring the church to put on these virtues. And let me tell you, my friends, at least in my experience, I don't put this jacket on today and these virtues on today and expect it to last. I have to put them on every single day in almost every single interaction in life, at home, in business. I have to put on these virtues because I'm representing Christ. The next one was bearing with one another. Oof, okay. <laughs> Again, being patient with one another. When you hear the word bear with one another, you think of church, right? You got to bear with people. I believe this should start, though, at home, right? In your inner circle. If you're married with your spouse, you know, be with your spouse, right? Be with your kids. In a group this size, I am certain that this morning, on your way to church, there might have been at least one couple who had a little bit of a dust up. And if, the, oh, someone's laughing. If that's you, raise your hand, right? <laughs> and here's the thing, right? Words like hurry up can be very triggering for a wife who's putting on her makeup, okay? Don't say hurry up. But that's triggering. Be here with one another. And in a church setting, we're all so different, right? We have different cultures. We have different races. We have different political leanings, different preferences, organs versus piano, praise team versus hymn, choir, all these differences. And sometimes we will not always agree. But here's the thing, though, right? If we just keep getting up and leaving every time we disagree, we could disagree with the pastor. Then that's not bearing with one another, right? When you're annoyed, when you feel okay, your feelings get hurt, our job, my job and your job, is to go before our Holy Father and ask him to give us his perspective, not your perspective, because our hearts are deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, the scripture says. So never trust your heart. Never trust your judgment. If we are in a group together, whether it's at the office, your workplace, or here for sure in church, Paul is speaking to the church. He's speaking to the church. And he's asking the church, bear with one another. We can't just get up and leave all the time when something doesn't feel good. All right, next one is forgiving one another. So bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, this is a given. People are going to have grievances, right? But the last part of that scripture is how I can forgive people. It says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. I can forgive people who hurt me from that one statement. Christ forgave me period. I must do the same. And so I, if I'm still struggling with forgiving someone, because look, you know, sometimes it takes a little while, you know, it takes a couple of days, two days, three days, someone gets, you know, gets you mad. But I have this internal conversation with myself that goes like this. This is God talking to me now. Sharon, remember when you did such and such and only you know, or you and a few people know? I forgave you, right? and I'm still using you. Hey, I'm in the pulpit today, right? <laughs> I'm using you. I forgave you. You can do the same. You know, I am not saying that, you know, when you forgive someone, you know, because some hurts go deep, that you have to become their best friend again. I'm not saying that, right? You don't have to continue in a relationship. You don't have to. Some hurts really, really run deep. But forgiveness is how we get healed on the inside. We cannot have unforgiveness in our hearts and have a great relationship with God at the same time. It will not happen, my friends. It will not be a great relationship. It will be a partial relationship with Christ. I heard a pastor say recently, do not drink that poison of unforgiveness. And he's right. Because you and I are the ones who will be dying, right? So this conversation between Peter and Jesus cracks me up. You know, in, in uh, I think it's Matthew, Matthew 
18. It says, Peter came to Jesus and said, asked, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And some say seven times 70. Peter thought seven is a number of completion, right? So if I forgive someone seven times, I'm good. And Christ was making the point that no, not seven times, 77 times. And it doesn't mean that on the 78th time it's over, right? He was making the point that just keep forgiving. And I thought, of, I thought to myself, right, how many times have God forgiven me? And I thought thousands. And let me tell you why it's thousands. I'm not a bad person, I promise you, but every God is so holy that we sin in our thought life, right? So every time a sinful thought comes to me, I have to ask God for forgiveness. So if I have one of those per day, three, six to five days a year, right? Times however old I am, 50 something, that's a lot of thousands. And so this is what Christ is asking us to do, right? To forgive. Again, I'm not saying that hurts don't run deep, but I'm saying that the forgiveness is for you. It's for us as a body, right? And then love, <clears throat> the biggest one, love. Over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Amen. Love is the big bow that we wrap around all these virtues I already spoke about. It's the unifying force that serves to glue us to each other, especially as believers in Christ. Friends, if we can't love each other, <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to have a cohesive church, to grow our church. We have to love each other, right? It's the first of all the spiritual gifts listed in Galatians 5.22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Love is a core aspect of God's character. God's love is not in conflict with his holiness, though, or his justness. I read that somewhere. And what this means is that not because God is love, it means that he won't judge us when we get off track. But God is loved. And in 1 John 4, 16, it says, we know how much God loves us, and we have to put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. All who live in love lives in God, and God lives in them. And let that sink in, right? If you're having a hard time loving someone, you know, check that, right, you know, put that circle around yourself. Because this may be something you have to bring to God. You know, I, if someone says in, in John, 1 first, John first 4.20, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that's to us, the church, right? If someone says, I love God, but I hate a fellow believer, that person is what? A liar. One of these things right here, okay? That person is a liar. Because if we don't love people who we can't see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? So um, this, is very, listen, this is very subtle and very easy to do, guys. Years ago, you know, when I was Southern Baptist, you know, we came up Southern Baptist, and back in those days when we were really in the Baptist church, you know, Baptists can feel a little superior, right? We, we have the word of God, we, you know, we, we are in quiet times all the time, and we were doing Bible studies. And I remember there was a, a relative of mine who was in another church that was a different denomination. And um, they were a, st a startup church, and I'm not saying we hated them, we didn't hate them at all. But you can have that little prideful edge as a denomination, right? But those are fellow believers, right? We have to check that out. I shared with my teach team recently um, that there was a denomination that told me I wasn't gonna go to heaven because I didn't celebrate the Sabbath the way they did. This is not right. This is not right, my friends, right? And so God is not asking us to be that way. It is hard to love unlovely people. I, I get that with different points of view, people who hurt you. But God is love, 
and we can ask him to change our hearts. Paul was speaking to the people in church. When we master becoming loving Christians, I think we would be more impactful in the marketplace. Right? But we got to master it here first. And then peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. So now Paul was saying, hey, among you members, live at peace. But I believe, though, for us to live at peace among members, we have to first find peace individually here. So we have to find the peace of God in our individual hearts, and we will see peace in the church. Now, how do we get that peace in our hearts? Psalms 34, 14 says, Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Remember I said how as Holy Spirit-filled believers, you know, peace is a natural fruit. But then it's saying here, we got to seek peace and pursue it. How do we get God's peace? How do we find that peace to deal with the daily challenges of life? the diagnosis that you're going to get, the, the financial problems, the, the marriage issues, the kids' issue. How do we get that peace? I know many Christians feel guilty because they don't have God's peace. Where is God's peace? Here's a hint. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. How do we keep our mind stayed on God? <laughs> How do you think, guys? Keep, keep in the word. Keep in prayer. Keep in fellowship continuously. I want to share a personal story recent, that happened to me recently. Some of you know that last November, I got that um, dreaded phone call, a dreaded phone call from your doctor. Mrs. Gill, your biopsy came back positive for breast cancer. So immediately, my peace left immediately. Thank God I had my husband and my daughter with me. And one of the first things I did was I called the elders of the church, you know, using the mandate from James 5.17 that says, is any one of you sick? How should he should call the elders to pray? And I never forgot Pastor Eric, when we were done praying, I was praying for peace, I was praying for healing. And Pastor Eric said to me, hey, I got a word for you while I was praying, and the word was steadfast. And Eric, you just don't know how that word steered me <clears throat> through that whole time. I would see that word steadfast everywhere I go, in all the scriptures, in all the sermons, being steadfast, remaining in God's word, getting God's peace. And God did give me his peace to the point where at one point I thought I was in denial about what was going on because <laughs> I had the peace that transcended understanding, right? It just, it did. I mean, I was, I, my, I didn't miss a day of work. <laughs> I was coming to church. I was, you know, dealing with it all because I stayed my mind on God's word. And so when we stay in God's word, right, when we make that commitment we get that individual piece. Look, I don't know what your story is in the, in the audience today. There could be someone here with a, a diagnosis like mine or something else, right? And you don't feel God's peace and you're wondering as a Christian, why can't I feel God's peace? Well, it's because you've got to stay in the word. You've got to be stayed in the word. Not just going to word today, you know, you have to be in it constantly. For me, I know that when I'm out of the word, the peace is less. Now, God was gracious to me, folks, and, you know, I, I had a surgery, and it was a very early stage cancer, and it was removed, and I was in remission right away, and I'm claiming my healing. But let me tell you, you know, that's what I'm claiming, but that's where I got that peace. And so, peace is contagious. Peace is obvious. People can see it, and they can sense it in you. And so, imagine when we have our own individual peace, and we come together as a body of believers, and we have peace among us. We're bearing with each other, right? We're being humble, right? We're being loved. When a visitor visits our church, they'll feel the peace, right? 
And it's just like when you visit people's home. Sometimes you can feel that tangible presence of peace, and you can also feel that tangible presence of wrath as well. And the next virtue, and I, I'm, I'm unpacking just a few more of these, it says be thankful and be thankful. I like to say practice gratitude. Thank God before you ask him for something else. <laughs> Thank him for your spouse, right? Thank you for people who do things for you, little things. Your spouse, thank her for cooking. Thank your husband for holding on his job. Thank your friends, they're golden. Thank your kids. Thank the pastors. If they preach a good message that blesses you, encourages you, you know, changed your life, thank them, you know? Um, you know, it, it's just so important that we practice being thankful. It can take you places and give you favor with people. We mentioned that we ran a charity years ago, and I remember there was a postman who delivered mail to the charity. And I had a food bank at the charity, and he brought me two little bags of food one day. But our philosophy at that charity, our core values said that if someone donates $5 or 50 Gs, they get the same nice letterhead, they get the same nice thank you. If they, donated, if, they do, if they donated cash or in kind, like bags of food, they get the same expensive letterhead saying thanks. So we gave this postman a nice letter. And he came back and he said, look, I have been doing this stuff for years, and no one has ever thanked me. And let me, give it, uh, let me just see if I can put, make this real quick. He then went back to his post, post office, and then he got another post office involved, and they got the union involved. And then our agency became the recipient of the postal drive, 75,000 pounds of food every year for like 15, 12 years. In addition to that, he said, when I was younger, I was poor. And it was a charity that actually gave me a Christmas gift. So I want you to create a program for the kids. And so I got with my kids, and we came up with a program called Touch a Heart for Christmas. Again, that postal office and the adjacent one as well, they gave 300 kids every year their desires, including a bed, because there were kids who were requesting beds, because these were poor kids, and they, would, they were allowed to write anything they wanted. And they would, kids were requesting beds, right? And so from two bags of food, just being thankful, the Lord bless us beyond Ephesians 3.20, above and beyond all we can ask or imagine. That's just practicing being thankful, you know? And you have to put on that, my friends, because we take a lot of things for granted. I have a, 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 a reminder in my phone every night that comes on at eight o'clock that says, list three things you're grateful for. And even if I don't stop and list it, it's a reminder that I'm supposed to be in gratitude mode at all times, right? As I'm coming down to the end here, it says, let the word of God dwell in you richly, verse 16. Quite simply, stay in God's word. Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden my word, your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Meditate on God's word. Study it. Sing it back to him. Pray back scriptures. Marinate in God's word, right? That's how we stay grounded in God's word. And let me tell you, when you stay grounded in God's word, when you and I stay grounded in God's word, we're going to experience peace. We're going to discover God's purpose for our lives, right? We're going to have that joy, that fulfillment. But we have to stay in the word, right? And the last point is whatever we do, whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Amen. Jesus. Friends, we are Christ, Christ's ambassadors. We bear his name, Christians, right? Christians should not be a dirty word. And it kind of is out there in the public domain, right? But guess whose fault is that? Absolutely, it's ours. We are Christ's ambassadors. We have to put on these virtues. We shouldn't take it for granted. We shouldn't think that because we got saved, we're it. No, God, getting saved is the beginning, right? We have to be proactive. We gotta be intentional. We gotta take off anger, take off lies, take off wrath, take off the old person. 
Take it off. Christ died for that. It was a costly price, right? And so we shouldn't take it for granted. We should put on these virtues. You know, we should really do it. And so whatever we do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We're Christians. Every action that we perform represents Christ. It's like parents. When we you know, raise our kids, we want them to represent us out there, right, with our values, right, with our value system. That's what we want. Well, Christ is asking the same thing too. Represent me out there. In um, 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God, as though God were making his appeal through us. We must keep putting on these virtues every day in the same way that we put on our clothing. Now, this nice jacket, I could keep it on for a few days, but after a while, it's going to be clammy. It's going to be icky, right? we got to put this on, fresh clothing every single day. And this is how we will become, you know, effective for Christ, right? This is how we're going to live up to his expectations. Over the next week, I am going to challenge each of us to put on these virtues, especially love. Because remember, love is a big bow that wraps around it all. And, you know, the praise band is going to come up in a minute to close us out. But I want you to think about if any of these virtues stuck with you. Again, remember, it's not about your husband, your wife, anybody else, your boss. It's about, is any, are, are there any errors in your life, like me when I wasn't kind, you know? Um, are there any areas of your life that you believe that you need to enhance, right? To layer up, to level up. We have prayer partners here. And I'm going to ask you to just be bold. Take that step. Pray with someone, right? Ask. The prayer of agreement is powerful. There may be someone that you cannot forgive in your own strength. Well, that's fine. But in God's strength, you can. There may be someone you just can't love. They're just so unlovely. They're irritating. But this is why we are chosen, right? We are set apart. We are holy. We are empowered with the Holy Spirit. God's given us everything that we need to have a successful life. He's equipped us with everything that we need to make this thing called church work. He's given us everything that we need, but we have to tap into that, right? We have to be intentional. So I'm going to ask you today to be bold for God. He was bold for you, right? He was kind enough to send his son. I'm going to ask you to be bold. Go give that to God. You know, pray with someone. Release that from you. Be better. You should not be the same person next year that you were this year. If you're looking at your behavior right now and you're saying, the way how I handle issues with anger or wrath or whatever is the same way I handled them last year, you know what that means? You're not growing. We're not growing. We may need to put on some fresh clothing. So, praise team, I'm going to ask you to sing my favorite song, Break Every Chain, because there is power in the name of Jesus to break any of these chains, to break any of these resistance. There is power in the name of Jesus, my friends. Mm -hmm.